Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your mercy to us in the Lord Jesus, and we thank you that you've given us your word. We pray this morning as we look at it together that you might address us, that you might give us that comfort that we need from your word, that guidance and wisdom that we need from it, and where we need to be challenged, would you challenge us as well, so that your word might be profitable in what it does in us. For this we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, have you considered how absolutely just and right our God is in all that he does? That everything God does, everything, is entirely right, unimpeachably just. His judgment is always thoroughly appropriate, never corrupt, never disproportionate. His mercy does not trample over justice, but is grounded deeply in the truest justice. So his extravagant grace is matched by the immeasurable faithfulness, obedience, and self-sacrifice of the Saviour, the glorious, majestic Son, who as the Lamb of God freely lays down his life to deal with sin and to rescue his people. Or God's forbearance, patience and long-suffering to provide again and again opportunities for repentance and the salvation of those who could not save themselves and who have not yet heard. Have you considered that his plan from the beginning is exactly as it should be? Well, it doesn't always feel like that, does it? From the ground view of our lives and struggles, it doesn't always feel like that. When we look at what's happening in our world, uh, where what was created very good has been distorted by human selfishness, and there's ample evidence of brutality and defiance of all authority and restraint, and where it seems to go on and on relentlessly, erupting here and then over there and there in another place, with no one being held accountable, and the mockery of God and his word unchecked, we might be tempted to question whether God is always just and his plan is always good. Or perhaps it was just derailed somewhere along the way. We've been travelling through the book of Revelation on Fridays and we've noticed repeatedly how this book is given to us, given to God's people living in a convulsing world which is rarely unalloyed joy and peace and goodness given to us so that we might have a glimpse of what's really going on. Because we need that glimpse. We need that glimpse in order to persevere, to endure and to have hope. Do you remember that uh, last time we heard twice in chapters 13 and 14, here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. But we need this glimpse too so that we can recalibrate our perspective on who God is, what he is doing, and what he has in fact planned from the beginning. So this morning we arrive at the fourth and final cycle of sevens in the book of Revelation. The fifth, if you count the letters to the seven churches. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven signs, seven bowls. The cycle unfolds for us in chapter 16 of the book after a somewhat elaborate preparation for it in chapter 15. And once again, I don't want us to get caught up in every minute detail of these chapters, as you may know that some do, but rather to ask ourselves, what do these chapters in particular have to say to us? What do they contribute to the overall message of this book, which we are encouraged to understand and take to heart? So in particular this morning, I want to draw your attention to four features of these chapters. And the first is something that we've already been thinking about. For you see, right through these chapters, the justice of what God is doing in pouring out his wrath on the world is emphasised. In the first instance, those who've conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside a sea of glass, sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb of God. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. 
Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. The wrath of God is about to be poured out on the earth. It will be fully expressed, fully expended. There will be nothing left. And at this very point, they cry, just and true are your ways. What God has done and what God is about to do is entirely right. It's entirely appropriate. In fact, the very anticipation of the wrath of God being poured out is something that evokes praise. And it's not only those who have conquered, but the angels who are themselves the agents of God's judgment who say this. In the next chapter, after the third angel pours out his bowl and the rivers and springs become blood, the angel says, Just are you, O Holy One, who is and who was. For you brought these judgments, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And even the voice from the altar gets in on the act. Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, True and just are your judgments. What does it take to stare God's fearsome judgment in the face and still say, you are just? True and just are your judgments. There are people, there have always been people who have no time for the wrath of God. I know people who refuse to sing any song that mentions it, who avoid parts of the Bible that speak of it, who insist it has no place in the gospel message. If God is loving and merciful, then he isn't wrathful and all people are forgiven. He's not a judge. He's a father. But as Miroslav Volf famously wrote, you can only say things like that in the quiet of a suburban home, not in a scorched land soaked in the blood of the innocent. It's impossible to say those things as you watch young children riddled with bullets, a hospital lying in ruins, the weeping victims of human barbarism. I mean, how did you feel when you saw the footage from Gaza and Israel? It's sickening, isn't it? The innocent lives mowed down, grotesque levels of violence and hatred rained down upon fellow human beings fear and suffering and anger and cruelty. Can you see those pictures or even just hear the reports of those who were there on the ground and remain unmoved, unshaken? As I said last week, no human being should do to fellow human beings what's been done in the last two weeks in the Middle East. And yet it has been done. And to our horror and disgust, it is excused and even championed in various parts of the world and here in our city too. But if the anger welled up inside you when you saw or heard of these things, as it did in me, what do you think it is like for the God who gives life to every human being and who surrendered himself to be the saviour of the world? Do you think he remains detached and indifferent in the face of what's been happening? Will God simply overlook what has been done? Will he just ignore this latest outburst of inhumanity that has its deepest roots in our refusal to acknowledge him as creator and redeemer? What kind of God would he be if he was not angrier, exponentially angrier than we are when we see these things? Of course, my anger is always tainted by my own self-interest, whereas God's is not. But his wrath blazes far more fiercely because it is so pure and selfless and born out of the richest and truest love. Mine is an almost uncontrollable emotional reaction. His is right and true and it is just. And remember, this is simply the latest in a very long line of such behaviours. Imagine yourself 
as one of those who liberated the concentration camps in Poland at the end of World War II and saw what was left behind, how would you react? Or as those who had to clear the streets after the St. Bartholomew Day massacre in 1572. Those who watched as old men were burnt for their faith during the reign of Bloody Mary. Those left behind after the sacking of Constantinople by the Crusaders in 1204. And then what about what was done when Jerusalem fell in AD 70 and before that in 587 BC? When you take in the long line of human history and add atrocity to atrocity, but most significant of all, the way the world treated the Saviour when he came, then we know that God must act. To be who he is. To be loving and compassionate. To be pure and holy. To be just and true. He must act. The wrath of God is a terrifying thing, but it is a good thing. We need the wrath of God. Without it, human rebellion and cruelty and suffering has the last word. What is very clear in these chapters is the justice of God's wrath. The second feature of these chapters I want to highlight is terrifying in a different way. It too is repeated as the chapters unfold. As God's wrath is poured out on the earth in such a devastating way, you might have thought that at last there would be some realisation on the part of those who had surrendered to evil, who bore the mark of the beast, that they've been on the wrong side, that they can't just go on as they have. You might have hoped they would have seen that those who, what those who conquered have seen, that this judgment is deserved, that God's ways are just and true. The warnings, after all, have been sounded at full volume. But it makes no difference. Even after four bowls have been poured out, the sores, the sea and the rivers turned to blood, the, the scorching heat... We're told in verse 9 of chapter 16, they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him the glory. And in the very next verse, in the wake of the darkness, they gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. And to cap off their determined opposition to God, even after six bowls have been poured out in chapter 16, 13 to 14, there is still no repentance. But demonic spirits continue to deceive and dupe the kings of the whole world into what can only be described as a suicide mission. To gather at the place where so ma many battles have taken place before, Armageddon, to do battle with God. So we ought not to be surprised when we see persistent opposition to God, even in the face of judgment. It is terrifying. It's perverse. But it's real. There is a point at which hearts are so hard, despising God has become such an ingrained habit that even judgment on this scale doesn't even make a dent. And the rebellion goes on. And I hope you didn't miss the familiar words that are given almost as an aside in verse 15. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. Don't be caught by surprise. Don't get mixed up with it. Almost literally, don't be caught with your pants down. It's going to be like this. But he is coming, and you've got to be ready. Well, thirdly, it's hard to read through these chapters and not think that we've been here before. The plagues, the victors standing by the sea and singing, very explicitly, the song of Moses, as well as the song of the Lamb, the tent of witness, 
And as the bowls of wrath are poured out, the sores, the sea turned to blood, the rivers and springs turned to blood, the scorching fire, the darkness, the frogs spewing out venom. It's the exodus all over again, but ramped up to another level. God's enemies are brought to the brink, entirely defeated and humiliated, a tremendous victory. And when they regather and assemble one last time to seek to overthrow God himself, the end is a foregone conclusion. Against the one who unleashed all of this, they don't stand a chance. Why this heavy reliance upon Moses and the Exodus? Because here in this identification is the clue to what's going on. In this terrifying series of judgments, each one enough to bring his enemies to their knees, the Lord is rescuing his people, vindicating his honour, realising his promise, and his people are safe. What God did once in anticipation of that day, he does with unrelenting finality on that day. And they are safe. Back more than a millennium before Christ, it was those who had a mark on their door who were not swallowed up in judgment. On this day, it is only those without a mark, without the mark of the beast, who will survive. In the midst of this judgment lies their final salvation and even the kings of the whole world assembled for battle are not the slightest threat. God brought the Israelites out of Egypt and their despair gave way to joy. The horse and rider thrown into the sea. But what is pictured here is a redemption far more glorious I mean, a judgment far more terrifying. You know where this is heading. Don't be afraid. And so we come to the last of the four things worth noticing in these chapters. Following on from one cycle after another, viewing the events between Jesus' resurrection and his return from one angle after another, right from the start, we're alerted to the fact that there's something different about this cycle, which means it's not just more of the same. Then I saw another sign in heaven, 15 verse 1, Great and amazing. Seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last. For with them, the wrath of God is finished. The previous cycles had been partial and limited. Only a portion of the world could be touched, and only for a fixed period of time. But this time, it's not a third or a quarter, but all. And this time, not for three and a half days or or 42 months, but until it is done. For in reality, there are no more warnings, but signs that the end has come. For with them, the wrath of God is finished. John wrote at the beginning of chapter uh, 15. It is done, cries the loud voice from the throne in chapter 16. You see, the warnings and the judgments won't go on forever. One day the war will be over. The city will fall and every island and mountain will be gone. Space will be cleared for a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. The final collision between good and evil is so entirely one-sided. A monumental earthquake splits the centre of opposition to God apart. The great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. And God himself ensures that Babylon the Great, that terrifying symbol of human self-assurance and denigration and defiance and degeneration, drains the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. He is taking it to the end this time. No more chances, no more mercy. This is what it is like at the end. The only ones left standing are God and the Lamb. After all, the elders and the living creatures are on their faces and the victorious bow before him and the defiant, unrepentant ones are gone forever. The wrath 
of God is finished. It is done. So four things to notice that hold all the details together in these two chapters. The justice of God's wrath, the perverse stubbornness of the rebellion, they will not repent, the strange comfort of the pattern of rebellion, Exodus revisited, a redemption that is greater just as the judgment is more terrifying, and the finality of the judgment of all in the great rebellion. And that's why we can keep going. We can keep enduring. We can keep trusting because the wrath of God is coming. Terrifying though it may be, it is good for human rebellion and cruelty and suffering does not have the last word. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, as we hear these words and understand the terrifying reality that they paint for us, we are comforted because we know that you have the last word and you will bring comfort to those who have suffered and healing to those who have been injured and life to those who have been martyred and your will will be done and your wrath will one day be finished. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.